Amen. We've been talking, this is uh, our fifth Sunday uh, that we're talking about uh, connecting with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, this, this started off for me as one message. We were, you know, we, in our student ministries, we're teaching our kids about the things of the Spirit and uh, teaching them about the gift and who the person is of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I just felt like I needed to take some time and do some teaching here on Sunday morning because it's been a while, and I have focused so much on developing a foundation of our relationship with God and understanding just how absolutely necessary it is for us to understand the Father's love towards us. But, you know, once you're rooted and grounded in God's love, that's where the gifts operate the best, all right? If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, you've got three chapters that deal with a lot of the gifts of the Spirit. But sandwiched right down in between all of it is chapter 13, which deals with the love of God. And really, the context of that entire chapter is dealing with the operation of the gifts, you see? Because you can have every gift of the Spirit in operation in your life, but if it's not rooted and grounded in the love of God, I'll tell you what, you might draw a crowd, you might see the miraculous take place, but you're not going to impress God. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. You might be world-renowned, but if you don't have a foundation that's based on the love of God, in the eyes of God, you have nothing, and it profits you nothing. And so that's why my emphasis has always been on our love relationship with God. But you know, if once that's secure and in place, and this is where God's bringing me, I focus so much on the character and love of God. You know, the Bible says that you're to pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, all right? So I spent so, so much time and so many years pursuing love and so afraid of the, um, you know, the things that can go wrong with the abuse and, and wrong use of the gifts that I wasn't even really, I found myself not even desiring the gifts. Isn't that a sad place? And so the Lord just began to deal with my heart and say, you know what? If you're rooted and grounded in the right place, then you need to desire because my desire is to flow through you. You got the right foundation, amen? And so I believe that's what God wants to do. And so God wouldn't let me just come and teach on the gifts. You, you need to, in order to, embrace all that God has for you, you need to desire. Remember the scripture said what? Desire what? Spiritual gifts, right? How many of you desire something that you don't value? I mean, let's say that, um, how many of you want to um, go see a um, Cincinnati Bengals game today? Cincinnati Bengals, all right? I know I'm in Redskins uh, uh, cowboy territory, so I, I know there's desire there, but when you start talking about somebody like the Bengals, how many of you know that, that if you don't desire something, you're not going to embrace it? You're not going to place a lot of value in it, and the only thing that we embrace in our lives are the things that we value and the things that we desire, and so you see, if I were to say, how many of you desire to go see the Redskins today? <laughs> Somebody's husband is, not, is there this morning because they have a desire. You see, desire moves us in a particular direction. And the thing is, is that you and I will never embrace the things of the Spirit of God unless we desire them, you know? In Psalms 37, it says, to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that neat? If you delight in God, he'll actually place in you the desire to do the very thing that he's called and created you for. Isn't that amazing? See, I used to think when I first got saved that if I delighted in God, he'd give me anything I wanted. That was pretty cool as a young Christian. The only thing is, is God never answered those prayers. <laughs> you know, in James, it says you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own Pleasure. So there's a difference between selfish desire and a desire that comes from God. Amen? So the thing is, is that we, as we delight in God, He places the very desire in you to do the thing that He's called you to do. 
So you're, you're, you're not like a stick in the mud that has to go down and, and be a missionary to Africa and, oh, God, I'm just sacrificing and, Lord, have mercy. You know, I can't wait till I get back. Now, I'll tell you what. If you're delighting in the things of God, there's something that's going to rise up on the inside of you, and you're not going to be able to hold you back. You're going to be on the first plane that you can get over there, and nothing's going to stop you. Amen? Not even back surgery. Not even back surgery. Amen? I mean, Andrea is a, really a, an amazing person. I mean, she had major surgery, back fusion, and within how many days? Uh, within two months. Within two months, she's on a plane doing a two-week uh, missionary trip to Africa. I think that's a miraculous, you know. Driven by desire, <laughs> amen, and, and a desire that was birthed by God. So listen, God's desire is to fill you with the fullness of His Spirit, to pour out His love into your heart, but through that expression of his love to manifest his glory in the world in which we live through signs and wonders and miracles that all point back to Jesus, the center of it all, right? So God wouldn't let me just do like one little teaching and come in and say, let's talk about the gifts. Now, we had to go back. We had to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit because, you see, if the Holy Spirit is just a thing, if he's just a power, if you don't understand the person of the Holy Spirit, you'll never really desire him. You'll just desire, you won't desire his face, you'll desire his hand. And I think too many times in the body of Christ, we're looking for the hand of God and we're neglecting his face. And so we talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about how he has, he's not just a person, he's God, right? So he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, right? He's, he's all of those things. That's our God. That's our Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was very active. He would come upon men in times and seasons to perform his work and to speak his word, but the Holy Spirit dwelt in a tabernacle, amen? In the Old Testament, he dwelt in a tabernacle, and then later on, Solomon built the temple, but Jesus said, the day is going to come where I'm going to destroy this tabernacle, and I'm going to raise up a new temple. Amen. And we talked about how the Bible says that you and I today, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Isn't that cool? I mean, when you look in the Old Testament and you see how the glory of God came into the temple, and there was a glory that was such a degree that the priest couldn't even stand, and the same Holy Spirit dwells in you, Lord, I can hardly stand. I think I'll have a seat. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you, we need to get a revelation of that. Do you recognize that the third person of the Trinity, I mean, the Father is in heaven and Jesus sits at his right hand, but the Holy Spirit has remained on the earth and he tabernacles inside of you. And until we begin to desire spiritual gifts, until we begin to desire and appreciate the person of the Holy Spirit, man, I'll tell you what, it's like having, well, what? We were, it, it's, it's like dying right next to a well. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you could, you could be thirsty, you could die of dehydration sitting right next to a well. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? And yet, you know, God has supplied all of our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ, and we go through life like we've got a, with a, this provision. Well, it's not even beside us, it's in us, right? And we try to live our life in our own strength and in our own power. You know, and the Bible says that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, it's by my Holy Spirit, right? So then we looked at the life of Jesus, and we saw that even Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he lived a life that was submitted 100% to the Holy Spirit. And that was to be an example to you and I of how we're supposed to live our lives. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I hear my Father saying it. I don't do anything unless I see my father doing it. And that's supposed to, and how did he see? It was through his intimate relationship with the father through the Holy Spirit, you see? And then after 30 years, what I call the silent years, where Jesus developed relationship, the time came for his public ministry to take place, and Jesus had, was baptized with the Holy Spirit when he was baptized by John. The Spirit descended upon him, and it remained. And guess where it took him? It took him straight out into the wilderness. How many of you are willing for a baptism that takes you straight to the wilderness? 
Say, oh God, this is you, and oh no, <laughs> you know. What am I doing out here in the wilderness? Why are all these devils showing up, you know? I thought this was deliverance. I didn't know that, you know. But I'll tell you, the devil's job is to promote you. In any, the devil works for God. They're not equals on any level. The devil is a fallen angel. He's entirely defeated by the blood of Jesus. He's under our feet. And so the only thing that the devil does is provides opportunities for you to be promoted. How about that? That gives you a different way of looking at things, doesn't it? So if we keep our eyes on Jesus and we follow him, and we be, learn how to live our life by the power of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to go from victory to victory to victory, right? So it's important for us to understand the person and the work and to connect with the Holy Spirit, all right? Again, you will never embrace what you don't value. So I'm praying that, that there's a hunger and a thirst that's rising up on the inside of you because there's something that God wants us to walk into. So that's kind of a review. Mm. <laughs> I'm not, going to do, I'm not going to do well this morning. God, you're going to have to help me. So this week is kind of a building week as we continue on with this series. And uh, it's really important for us to understand what I want to share with you this week because it, if we don't, we're not going to be ready for next week. All right? So be sure and come back next week. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 20. Jesus demonstrated what a life was like that was fully submitted to the Holy Spirit. Jesus submitted himself to the point of death on the cross, and he was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit that lives inside of you and I. After Jesus was raised, it says in John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, it says, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Okay? And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? Isn't that cool? What do you think the disciples did? I think they received the Holy Spirit, don't you? Okay. So, we have this, and this is kind of our beginning here. Afterwards... Jesus appeared to individuals over a period of 40 days. And at one point, he, it, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he appeared to a group of over 500 at one time. I would have loved to have been in any one of those meetings. How about you? Amen. So what are the things do you think that Jesus was talking about after his resurrection? You know, there are, there are a number of things. First, he appeared to, to Mary Magdalene, and he appeared to some of the disciples, and he gave proof of his resurrection, right? Okay. He appeared to uh, Thomas, who was doubting, and so he had to give him a special visitation. So no problem if you're doubting on any level. I'm believing for special visitations. Amen. And he appeared to Peter as well to affirm his call, and to affirm his love for him. These are some of the instances that are recorded in the scripture of Jesus after his resurrection. Um, in Luke chapter 24, Jesus meets a couple of guys on the road to Emmaus, and they're just trying to figure out what's going on because they knew in their heart that Jesus was the Messiah, but things didn't really work out the way that they thought it would. How many of you have found that to be true in your life? That God will show you a truth, but it doesn't quite come to pass the way that you think it will. That's a big story of my life, amen? God has always done everything that he says he's going to do, but he's never done anything the way that I thought. And that's because I'm not God, and he is, and he just knows better. And so we just need to learn to trust him on that. So Jesus opens up the eyes of these two on the road to Emmaus, opens up their scriptures and their understanding so that they can see that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies that were spoken for thousands of years before his coming. But all of this was building up to a climax, all right? 
10 days prior to the day of Pentecost, Jesus begins to speak of, I believe, the most important thing. How many of you believe the, the last words of an individual are usually pretty important words? All right. And so in Matthew chapter 28, verses uh, 16 and 18, Jesus is speaking to his uh, disciples and... Um, In verse 17, it says that when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And boy, I wish I had time to unpack some of this stuff, but I don't. But what were they, they doubtful about? They weren't doubtful about Jesus being there. They were still trying to figure out what the mission was. You know, they thought he was going to reestablish an earthly kingdom with the glory that Solomon had in his days. And yet Jesus died on the cross, and there he's raised. And so they're trying to figure out how He's going to conquer the Romans. And, you know, so they haven't quite got this thing figured out. So Jesus begins to answer that. And he says, all authority, not just the authority of Rome, but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So then, in, if you flip over to the book of Acts, chapter 1, and you need to understand this, that, that the book of Luke and the book of Acts were written by the same author, all right? So this is Luke basically continuing the same narrative. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, this, this sounds like the same thing that Luke's saying in his gospel. He says, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Don't leave. But wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now, all right? So Jesus' final words to his disciples is, listen, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. In John chapter 20, Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Then in Luke chapter 24 and what we're looking here in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, he says, um, I don't know, if we, did we look at that or not? We haven't? Okay. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus says, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. In the book of Acts, he says, Wait in Jerusalem until you're baptized, in Luke, he says, wait until you are endued with power, all right? So there's something about this baptism that is an endowment of power that comes from Almighty God himself, all right? Are you all following with me here this morning, okay? So again, the question is, didn't the disciples receive the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathed on them? The answer is yes. Then what does this verse mean? A lot of people have debated and questioned exactly what was it that happened when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, wait in Jerusalem until you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but in my 30-some years of being in, in the church and pri primarily in charismatic churches, there's been this, this sense of, well, you know, some people have said you don't receive the Holy Spirit until you are baptized and speak in tongues. Other people say, well, you receive the Holy Spirit when you're born again. And so how do you, how do you clarify these differences? You know, who's right? Yeah, both. Both are right. But why? Do you understand? I want you to understand this morning why. The why behind that. And this is something that the Lord unpacked for me. And it really helped me because I, I struggled with this a little bit. Because I believe, you know, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, I think they, you know, received the Holy Spirit. 
At the same time, if he said, wait in, in Jerusalem until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, until you're endued with power, I believe Jesus meant that too, don't you? So if they received the fullness of the Spirit in John chapter 20 when he breathed on them, why did they have to wait in Jerusalem? I mean, I don't know about you, but that's puzzled me for a long, long time. And for a while I used to say, well, you know, the, the secret thing belongs to the Lord. <laughs> You know, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. And I just thought, well, this is just one of those secret things. I just, I just don't understand it. You know, and so I, I, just, I just would pray and just ask God to give me a revelation. And so I found an article a couple of months ago that really helped me put this in a perspective that allowed me to appreciate what God is doing. All right? And it's really, really cool, I think. Hope you find it to be interesting. So um, this was an article, it was published by, uh, uh, through CBN, and uh, there's some things that we need to understand about baptism, because Jesus is talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I want to look about, at baptism here for a second, all right? In order to be baptized, you need three things, all right? You need three things. You need an administrator, you need someone who's going to do the baptizing, right? Okay, that's the first thing you need. Then, then you need an element. Okay, you need the, the, the thing that you're being baptized into. All right. And then you need a recipient, someone who's going to surrender to this baptism and is going to bring about some sort of change. Okay, are you all, are you all following me with the, the, the three elements that are involved in a baptism? Okay. So look in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will. And this, this scripture here really kind of opened this up for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And it says this, it says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. By one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Who's the Spirit? The Spirit is the Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit here is the administrator. Okay? Would you all agree with that? Okay, by one Spirit, we, who are we? Yeah, we're, we're us. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're the recipient, right? We're the recipient who's going to submit ourselves to the administration of baptism, in this case, by the Holy Spirit. Okay? What's the element? What is it that we're being baptized into? Okay? Right. Okay? We're baptized into the body of Christ. Okay? So, and John said this in his gospel, John 3, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, okay? So when Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, there's a baptism that took place there. And it was the Holy Spirit who was the administrator, and he was baptizing the disciples, and those of us who were born again, he was baptizing us into the body of Christ. All right? Okay? Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the one who is immersing the believer into the body of Christ, which makes the person a new creation in Christ Jesus, all right? So the change is that we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and we're born again, all right? Does that make sense? For me, a light bulb went on, and I said, oh, wow, you know, that's as plain as the nose on my face, and I've missed it for like 30 years, but it's important for us to understand this so that we can appreciate the Word of God. We can appreciate the, the way that the Spirit of God is working, and we can position ourselves to receive all that God has for us, all right? So every born-again believer has experienced this baptism. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, all right? Cool. Then... Now let's look 
at another baptism. Remember Jesus' words in, uh, it's actually Matthew 3.11, but it's also, uh, I think it's Mark 3.16, where John the Baptist said that I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me, the sandals of whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. All right? So Jesus came so that you and I could be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So in this baptism, and in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says that you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. As a matter of fact, it was only 10 days from the day that Jesus was ascended into heaven until the day of Pentecost. I think that Jesus spoke to his disciples and prepared them for what was getting ready to come, an endowment of power, all right? So let's, let's, let's look at this. Who is the administrator in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Who's the administrator? Jesus said that I, John baptizes with water, but I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so who's the administrator? Jesus is the administrator, okay? What's the element? What are we being baptized into? We're being baptized into the Holy Spirit, all right? Who's the recipient? We are. we are. Okay? So listen, it's important to understand the, the, the way that God works. Everything is done decently and in order. Okay? So the Father, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So what did the Father give? The Father gave the Son, right? And the Son so loved us that he gave his life and he also gave the Holy Spirit, you see? We couldn't receive a baptism in the Holy Spirit until we were first born again. Does that make sense to anybody here this morning? I'll tell you, I wish I'd have had this a long time ago. So many people, you know, just... Or wonder where they are in their relationship with God or, or, you know, the enemy likes to come in and bring division in the church and based on misunderstanding of doctrine. You know, if you say a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit because they haven't had an Acts 2 experience, well, we really don't know what we're saying and we're really causing more division than anything else. And the way I've always positioned myself if I don't understand, love always believes the best, so I'm going to believe the best. There's no way you can be born again without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. But there's something different about being baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ and, being, and then once you're in the body of Christ, being baptized by Jesus into the Holy Spirit. They're, they're two totally separate they're two totally separate events with two totally separate purposes, all right? So the answer to the original question, the disciples were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. They were then instructed to wait until they were baptized by Jesus in the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. There they would be endued with power to become witnesses, okay? So we're baptized in the body of Christ and we're born again. We become new creations. The Spirit of God dwells in us and we're just like Jesus during the, that first 30 years where he learned, I don't know if he had to learn, but you and I, we've got to learn our identity. We've got to learn the importance of communing with the Father and the Spirit within allows the fruit of the Spirit to be developed in every believer's life. But yet there's a separate experience that Jesus wants to bring every believer into. It's an invitation. And that's to be baptized by Jesus into the Holy Spirit. Okay? So 
The baptism in the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with an overcoming life. Many people believe that I can't overcome unless I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Revelation verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 11 says that we overcome what? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. And I don't know why, but everybody only quotes two-thirds of that verse. Because the verse ends that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and not loving our own life unto death. That's not quite NASB, but uh, I cut my teeth King James. So we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and not loving our own life. You see, that's, what every, that's the difference between a Christian and everybody else in the world, is everybody else lives for themselves. Everybody else loves their own life. But there's something about Christ. There's something about Christians. Christians. Did I say that right? Christians. Christians. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had the, my emphasis was on the wrong syllable. <laughs> so, as Christians, we're supposed to be like Christ. Christ demonstrated the love that you and I, that's foreign to us, because in our sin nature, life became all about me. It became all about what I could get, how fast I could get it, how much I deserved it, and who cares about you, right? But there's something different about a Christian. When God's love is shed abroad in our hearts, by who? The Holy Spirit. You see, that makes all of the difference. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but that's okay, you don't know. Uh, but the Father came, and He gave His, his best. He gave His Son. The Son came, and He gave His best, and He baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. What do you think the Holy Spirit's job is? Anybody want to know? Anybody want to go see the Bengals this afternoon? <laughs> Where's your desire? Okay. The primary work of the Holy Spirit is... In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to take the love of the Father and to manifest it in and through your heart. That is the most important thing. You, I mean, I'll tell you what, most people don't even have a, an idea. We talk about love, you know, we're river of love. Everybody, is, everybody knows love or thinks they understand love, but love is the greatest revelation that you'll ever get. The Holy Spirit's job is to baptize you in the Father's love. The Holy Spirit, again, as an administrator, baptizes us back into the Father's love. And it's there in that place that we pursue love and we desire spiritual gifts that we see the balance of who God created us to be on the earth. You see, it's, it's so easy to just get off into one thing and neglect the purpose and the power behind it. So the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to do with the overcoming life. He brings new life. But the baptism brings an endowment of power. And the endowment is for the purpose of empowering you to be a witness. Jesus didn't perform any mighty works until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus laid aside his glory as the almighty Son of God. He laid aside that glory in Philippians chapter 2. He laid that aside and he became a servant. And, and he took upon himself the form of a, of a man and humbled himself to the point of death. You see, Jesus' life is an example to you and I of the life that he's called us to follow. He said, follow me. That doesn't mean follow a book. It means to imitate a lifestyle that was demonstrated in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, how many of you are, are, are with me this morning? Are you good? Y'all caught, caught the difference there? So what I want to do 
when we get together the next time is I want to look, we're going to look at the day of Pentecost, we're going to look at the book of Acts, and we're going to see what this baptism in the Holy Spirit is, all right? We're finally getting to the good stuff, <laughs> stuff I've been, I've been waiting, waiting for, but, but it's important for us to have a foundation in our lives, because I'm telling you that in this world, especially in the days in which we're living, there are storms that are coming. You know, Jesus tells the parable, I think it's in Matthew chapter 6, he says, you know, that it's important not to just be hearers of the word, but doers as well, because if we build our house, what are we building our house on? Are we building our house on sand, or we want to build our house on the rock? Both houses are going to get the same storm. Same storm. Only one of them is going to stand. Is it the 50-story luxury hotel that's built on the sand? Hey, hey, hey. Or the one-story cinder block hut that's built on the rock? <laughs> We're all building, but what really matters is the foundation that we're building on. Because I'm telling you, storms are coming. Storms are coming. I mean, you look at stuff that's happening in the world today, and the Bible says that in the last days, the love of most will grow cold. What does that mean? If the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and the love of most is grown cold, what that says to me is that most people don't know, understand, appreciate, or desire the person or the work of the Holy Spirit because his job is to pour the love of God out into our hearts. You see, if, if we lose sight and we don't be, continue to desire what God wants to do, we're going to miss out. Because listen, you and I, in our own strength, we can't do anything. I mean, we can do a lot of good works. We can preach some sermons, you know. We can build up our head with the knowledge of God, but the experience of his person, the experience of his presence, the experience of his power only comes when we're baptized first into the body of Christ and second, baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is what is going to make a world of difference and a world of change, all right? And that's where we're at. I believe with all of my heart, as I've been praying, and we were in prayer before service today, and just in my spirit, I felt the Lord speak and had that vision in Ezekiel, uh, the, the valley of dry bones. And we've, we've talked about that a good bit over the years here. And I've kind of looked at, you know, what God's been doing in our midst just like that. And God's been bringing, you know, there was a, there was a great and mighty... Um, valley and it was scattered with bones. And so there had to have been a great warfare that had taken place and a great defeat. Okay. Discouragement set in. All, death was just all around. And people said when they looked at the bones, can these bones live? There are people who've looked at, at this church and they've said, and maybe even you and I have asked ourselves from time to time, can this church live? Can we live? And, you know, we can't do anything in our own strength to make things happen, but all of a sudden, you know, the Spirit of God begins to move. Bone begins coming to bone. Not just to a bone, but its bone. All right? We don't want some funky looking <laughs> thing. <laughs> bone has to find its bone. <laughs> you find your right place, all right? The knee bone's connected to the, you know... <laughs> You got to get things connected where they're supposed to be. Know the song and then do the job, right? So the Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God has, has, has guided and directed our path to this point. And I'm telling you, the wind of the Spirit is blowing. The wind of the Spirit is blowing. The wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing. And He's getting ready to raise up a giant army. 
Amen. By his spirit, a great and mighty army. And I'll tell you, in the day in which we live, that's what the world is crying out for. All of creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that's who you and I are, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's who we're called. And you know what it is? It's nothing more than the outgrowth of a great love relationship. It's not about the signs and wonders. It's about a love relationship and then us loving the world the same way that Jesus did. God so loved the world that he gave. Do you love the world? Can I say something pretty strong? You'll never give until you love. You'll never give until you love. You can hear the great commandment and the great commission all day long, but until you love the world the way the Father loved the world, until you love our community, instead of just being judgmental about everything that's going wrong in the community, if we love the way that God loved, then we're going to do something. We're going to pray, yeah, but once we pray, we're going to do much more than pray. These bones are going to come together, all right? A body is going to come together in unity. And we're going to go outside of the four walls of this building and be the church. Amen. <laughs> I mean, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for transformation, but it starts with us. It starts with us. Number one, understanding that we are part of one body. Let's stop killing ourselves. All right. <laughs> I mean, we're baptized into the body of Christ. Let's stop decapitating. Let's, try, let's stop trying to recreate a boneyard that God's trying to put together. All right? Let's, let's begin to value one another, value our differences, and come together and pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, and allow God to do what he wants to do in and through us as we seek him, as our relationship becomes tight, you know? You know, Jesus spent his, his nights in prayer, communing with the Father, hearing what the Holy Spirit was saying, and he spent his day serving, you know? Christianity must be converted into some sort of a lifestyle. It has to be converted into something that makes a difference. I'll tell you what, I, I, I think the devil would love it. And I think that he would give us the ground called the church building. He'll let us have all of the spiritual gifts and signs and wonders and everything take place in the four walls of your building as long as you promise not to take it out. But can I tell you this? That the world is not going to come into the church because of our facilities, because of our worship team, or because of anything that happens in the building. People are going to come into the church because they're going to have an experience with the love of God. They're going to have an experience with the Holy Spirit through you as we go out into the world. That's where we've been called, right? And we've got to go out not alone. Jesus said, listen, hey, you guys aren't ready to go yet. They were baptized into the body, but he said, you're not ready yet. So go to church. You know, go to Jerusalem, wait in this house. And only 120, I don't know how many were invited, but 120 showed up and they stayed in the house until they were endued with power. Once they were endued with power, guess what? <laughs> they went out the house. Amen. <laughs> they went out and they proclaimed and they preached and they were in their community and they were demonstrating the love of the Father with signs and wonders following. Amen. So we need to stay in the house for a little while. <laughs> for a little while. Until we're endued with power. And then there will be such a change and such a transformation that takes place. Listen, the disciples in the upper room, the 120 that gathered, they were in fear. Jesus had been crucified. Lord knows how many of them thought they would be next. They gathered together in that place. They didn't know what to do. They just knew Jesus said, go here. <laughs> Wait until you're in due. What does that mean? I don't know, but we'll know when it happens, right? 
we'll talk about some of that next week. But something dynamically happened. Something radically changed these disciples on the day of Pentecost. And they could not hold back. <laughs> they could not hold back. And that's what I'm believing for in each and every one of our lives is that God stirs up the gift that's on the inside of you, that you're so filled with the love of God that you can't hold back. See, the commission isn't something that we have to do. It's something that we're compelled to do. It's something that we get to do. It's something that we must do, all right? Just like Andrea when she went to Africa. You know, there's, there's a fire that's lit in your bones. You know, nothing's going to hold me back. How many of you got that fire here this morning? Amen. And if, if not, that's okay. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the work of the Holy Spirit. We need to focus on what God said to focus on. Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. Trust that the one who baptized you into Christ will lead you into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That he will endue you with, endue you with power from on high. And when he does... Watch out, world. <laughs> Watch out. Watch out. And I know, you know what? Many of us here this morning, we've already received that baptism. But God wants to stir things up. He wants to take us to another level. The day in which we live demands that the church rise up. It demands that we have a presence in our community. Jesus is coming again. And he's not coming again for a immature bride in diapers, right? He's coming for a mature bride, one who's made herself ready, whose lamp is filled with oil, and that represents the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, Jesus is coming again. And it's sooner than what we think. And I believe that God is raising up an army of John the Baptist who will rise up and bring a, a clarion voice into our community that it's time to repent, time to change the way we think because the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen? Amen. Can you stand with me this morning? I did pretty good. How about that? <laughs> That's amazing. I'm shocked. <laughs> is that clock right back there? Is that right? There's no way. <laughs> See, I do, we do believe in miracles. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. You all know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you guys. All right, well, let's, uh, let's pray. Can I get somebody on the... Oh, you're already there? <laughs> Translated from the back. And... All right. All right, well... Let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we just, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us so much that you've taken the initiative to come to us in a way that we know that it's you. And Father, I pray for every person here this morning, Lord, that has heard and has experienced worship and our time together. Lord, that they will know that you're in this place. Lord, that they'll know that you love them more than they could ever, ever imagine. Lord, there, there was a great price that was paid so that we could be baptized into your body. That it was impossible for you to redeem the world unless you restored man back to that place where he was before sin ever took place in the Garden of Eden. But you did that through Christ. You did that through your blood. And then you baptized us into your own body so that we might be one with you. And the driving force behind all of it is your love for your creation. Not just for man, but for all of your creation. back in a relationship. They're my kids. They're back in the family again. But they need power. Because your earnest desire is to see creation restored back under the dominion of man and under the glory of Almighty God. 
And you knew that we couldn't do it alone. So you sent an example and his name was Jesus. You endued him with the Holy Spirit because we needed to be endued with the Holy Spirit. You baptized us in the Spirit and fire because the world needs a baptism in your love and in your fire. And Father, I pray right now, Lord, as we search our hearts, Lord, as we sang at the beginning of the service, Jesus, you are the center of it all. Nothing else matters. So I just ask, Father, that you will just speak to every person here this morning. Let the truth from your word resonate in our hearts. Stir us up with a passion and cause that passion to become compassion. And allow that compassion to drive us into our communities and into the places where there's need. so that you can display your love. That signs and wonders and miracles would take place as a demonstration of your love that you have for the world. If that's you this morning and you're a candidate to be a part of this end time army where the wind of the Spirit is blowing and he's saying, will you connect to the bone that I've called you to? Will you stop fighting what I'm trying to do in your life? And will you trust that by my Spirit, I'm connecting you where I am trying to move you? Will you stay connected? Will you allow my Spirit to flow in you and through you and unite you and connect you and to empower you? And to know that where you go, you don't go alone. You're a part of a body baptized by one spirit. If you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I want to connect. I want to find my spot. I know where I'm supposed to connect and I'm committing to that right now. If you know that, just raise your hand. Just not to me, but just as a sign before you and God. And I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit will continue to blow in your life. That He'll continue to connect us by his spirit and there are people that we're supposed to be connected to that are out in the community that don't even know the love of God and he's going to use you because of the blood of the lamb because of the word of your testimony because you don't love your own life unto death God will use you he'll pour out his spirit through you. Father, I want to be baptized by that. Father, pour out your Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. You are so welcome in this place. Hallelujah. Well, amen. Amen.